Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Show, where we take a look at how you approach your work and personal life and how we can make the most out of both of them. A weekly get-together where we get real about self-improvement and development as we all make this not-so-easy journey through life. Our discussions will cover ideas and concepts from how to grow your career to how to lead your family towards prosperity and happiness. We don't pretend to know it all, and the doctor is the first to be vulnerable, discussing his own weaknesses, both past and present. This is about growing together and having some fun while we discuss what is happening in the crazy world we live in and how to make the most of it. Let's strive for awesome together. Let's get after it. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Dr. Leadership Podcast, episode 99. Unbelievable. 99 uh, weeks ago, well, 90, 94 weeks ago, actually, we started this little endeavor together. I uploaded five episodes the first week because that's what they said you're supposed to do. So 94 weeks ago, uh, we started this endeavor. And uh, next week uh, for episode 100, <clears throat> we'll see if I can come up with something a little bit uh, special for that. Maybe bring some music and stuff back in. Haven't done anything like that in a while. Just been kind of talking off the hip. But uh, hope you enjoyed episode 98 last week on optimism uh, and, uh, you know, every letter of the word stands for something. So just make sure that you give it a listen, carry your own sunshine, but again, hope you had some good, uh, some, um, you know, good vibes out of it, whatever you want to say. Uh, next week, now I've got two really, really good Leadership Lounge episodes coming up. And you know how you can find out how good they are is you go out and you join the Leadership Lounge membership site. You go to www.drleadershipresults.com, click on subscribe, enter your information, join up, you get early access. I record these things on the weekend. You get every weekly episode a little bit early so you can be a trendsetter talking about, hey, did you hear what the doctor had to say before anybody else? And you also get access to the Leadership Lounge interviews with other leaders uh, other people that are excellent in their field from all different fields of life. I've had Super Bowl winning coaches on. I've had F-15 fighter pilots on. I've had Special Forces helicopter pilots on. I've had executive leaders on. I've had um, coaches. I've had pilots of um, uh, private airlines. I've had all sorts of different people here. I've had uh, military commanders that were fighting Al-Qaeda as their ship was being uh, blown up by garbage boats. I've had all sorts of good stuff out there. And if you haven't seen it, go also out to www.drleadershipresults.com. Click on former episodes. You can see all that stuff out there. But go out and join, give it a shot. But I am really excited about the next two people I'm having on. So next week, um, I've got this uh, first one getting recorded up. A young lady by the name of Ali Starks. And she is the founder of Ali Starks Wellness. She'll join us to discuss the spirituality concepts of leadership, a bunch of other really good stuff. Great lady. Started out in the wellness field, been out in L.A. for a long, long time. As recently, the last few years, moved over to Denver to get away a little bit of the craziness. And also because love grabbed her heart and they had to meet somewhere in the middle. And... She decided on Denver, but been just an incredible uh, uh, person in the uh, fashion field. Um, a lot of things uh, have come uh, from her teaching and learnings, like I said, around spirituality, uh, et cetera. So very excited to have her on. We'll be loading that up to the membership site in the next couple weeks. A couple weeks later, you won't be able to hear it until a couple weeks after that. Then we'll load it up out there. Also coming up on the lounge, we have a conversation around transformational leadership with Gavin Finn, he's CEO and founder of Kaon, which is a virtual reality uh, company out of Boston area. Very excited. He has customers internationally. I actually interact with uh, with his company. We use their services, and it's awesome stuff. It's uh, like I said, it's uh, virtual reality, high high tech stuff that that we use to help demonstrate products and services. Now that we're in this remote work environment, people don't go in offices, etc. All these new technologies have come to bear. So I'm actually going to be a guest on his show, and he's going to be a guest on my show in one recording. We're going to go back and forth, talk about transformational leadership, and we'll load that up. Um, so it'll be a little different format, but very excited about that. They had reached out and asked me to join theirs, and and uh, after talking, we said, hey, we think we can make a, a one-and-done approach here instead of having to do two sit-down and recordings. Um, let's just both utilize the same conversation pieces, share it to our audiences, and, and away we go. So two excellent Leadership Lounge episodes coming up. Uh, so I hope you can join um, to uh, to gain access to all these other people. Again, I don't have all the answers here, folks. I've had a lot of experiences 
that help me avoid making mistakes because I've made them all before. And I just try to share that. And then the leadership lounge comes into play because I want to bring other people in to tell their story on how their road to success happened and give their feedback on what are some of the difference makers uh, that you can instill into your approach in life. Uh, whether it be your personal life, your family life, your neighborhood life, your community, philanthropically, in the business world you're in, if you're a leader, if you're an individual contributor, if you're the receptionist at the front desk, all these different things around mindset and uh, attitude adjustments that I promise will lead to better outcomes in your life and you'll enjoy the ride more. Carrying your own sunshine is a lot better than just being in stormy skies all the time and be woe is me and playing Eeyore uh, from the old uh, Winnie the Pooh uh, days. So, Today, I want to discuss something that's been very, very personal to me the last few weeks, and I want to discuss important lessons we all can learn from that uh, that old saying, the greatest generation. And this one, as I said, hits really close to home. I've touched on a little bit some of the listeners out there I interact with at work, etc., and uh, some of you don't know, but many of you do know. Um, well, first of all, this part, I was a late child, uh, World War II and Depression near a parent's. My dad left for the war days after graduating from high school, left for basic, basically went over to Chicago to join the Navy. That's where basic training was. And World War II still happens there today. My nephew went through it four years ago, now in the nuclear propulsion program down in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Cal, shout out to you. But he graduated from high school and, uh, and left for boot. And then six weeks later, was on a boat to the Philippines. So um, mom was in uh, Sigourney, uh, close to Washington, Iowa, a little bitty town, graduating class, you know, measured in the teens, 13, 14, 15 people. So she left home, right? Nothing in Sigourney for a, for an 18-year-old woman to do uh, unless she wanted to find a local farmer to marry, and lots of people did. I have an aunt that did that, um, and uh, one of her children actually did that, still over in that part of the country. But she left home to the big city to find a life on her own. She attended beautician school and was working as a waitress at a local supper club to kind of put things through. But um, uh, see, I just want to say that years ago, before everything came to us in the palm of our hands or on a silver platter or um, nepotism and things of this nature, people had to go off and, and cut their own trail. How they did it was with you know things like effort and grit. They used gestalt, tenacity, and optimism, like we discussed last week yet again. Um, we, as a society, need to listen to our elders. You know, the ones with all the experience, let's put it this way. We need um, their tough love. We need these tough love adults back in our culture. And this is, as as I started to say a few minutes ago before I went down the tangent of explaining uh, that I'm a, a World War II kid, it's really fresh right now in my mind and very relevant since my mother, and this is what I was talking about, people at work uh, know this a little bit, she turned 95 on the 25th of August. And when I say 95 years young, man, sharp upstairs. I mean, just got got it all together at 95 years old. But, um, you know, the, the car's starting to act up a little bit. But um, two weeks ago, like I said, she turned 95. And for the last two months almost, she has been in and out of the hospital uh, for that entire time. She's had uh, a couple of infections that keep rearing their heads back up. And she's been fighting through all sorts of pain and discomfort all the time saying she is sorry for being a burden or saying things like, I don't mean to complain. There are others who are really sick, (laughs) really sick, says the the 95 year old who has been in a hospital bed for, you know, half the time the last seven weeks. Now she's fighting the next thing had all these antibiotics, and she got what's called C. diff. And I won't get too deep into it. It's an ugly thing that causes a lot of gastrointestinal issues and back on more antibiotics, et cetera. And uh, I know she's tough because the doctor has told me more than once what she has been through the last seven weeks would kill 95% of the the 90-year-olds. She's 95 just going at it, so she's a fighter. So all of this, the episode today I'm calling Listen, um, 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 lessons from a 95-year-old. Couldn't get it out, sorry. The reason I'm calling it that is I've just been watching this experience and seeing how she is handling this very traumatic and very bummer, bummer-esque uh, situation she's been in. How she's handled it has been very, very uh, enlightening to me and has reminded me of a number of things. It's been a sad state to watch her. 
You know, watch to, to sit there and watch someone you love so much go um, through such discomfort. But man, has she been an inspiration. You know, it's she doesn't know it. She doesn't do it to be that way. It's just off the cuff how how she is, how my dad was, how my siblings are, and how, um, uh, and not calling my siblings elders here, but they're all 11 to 18 years older than I am. The world was just a different place. The mindset that I have been reared and raised around and have had visible to me my entire life is what makes me tick the way I tick. It makes, makes me feel the way I feel. I'm an older soul because of it. But man, she's been inspirational without even knowing it. Some of these inspirational moments she has shown me, um, like I said, without any intent, without even knowing what's going on, she's just being herself. She's just being Shirley. She's just being an example of how to do it. And I, and I called this lessons of a 95-year-old because, man, there could be a lot of giving up right here. There could be a lot of the dogs out of the fight going on. And, man, she's facing the, the toughest things you face, your own mortality. And it ain't pretty right now for her. And she's a champ. So I thought I'd share a few things. The first thing that she has done, and if you've never had a serious hospitalization, I had one in 2010 for a surgery, gastrointestinal thing too. I had a foot taken out of my colon. I had diverticulitis, fought it, fought it, fought it, antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. And they said, hey, someday you're going to die of pneumonia at 65 years old because you're going to have so much resistance to these heavy antibiotics. We need to do something. And I said, cut it out of me. Greatest decision I ever made. But one thing you discover quickly when you're hospitalized is you better um, show tremendous humility. <laughs> See, these hospital states, they're very humbling. Ass hanging out of those hospital gowns as you uh, you know fight terrible gastrointestinal de- issues like I did, but also my mother is going through right now. See, that, that'll humble you up in a hurry. Doesn't matter what title is in your name. Doesn't matter if you've got a PhD or a doctorate. Your ass is still hanging out of the gown, Jim. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. You aren't the stoic person you uh, may hope you may uh, you are always showing to be or always wanting to be. She has been kind. She has not been short with nurses or doctors, even though she's flipping miserable, right? See, she and those like her don't want any special attention. They don't want any special consideration. She's always said, honey, to me, she's talking to me now. I'm playing Shirley. I'm not doing it very well. Brent, you aren't special. You're special to me, but you're, you aren't special in this world. You're just chemicals and compounds like everybody else. You still get up, grace of God. You still got to go to work. Still got to work hard. Still going to make mistakes. You aren't special. As parents, think about that when you're talking to your children. They are special to you, but don't treat them so special that they just become ick, right? But she hasn't wanted any special attention or consideration. Today, in our society, see, that's all everyone seems to want. Something for themselves, just because... Uh, they, they feel they're owed it, or they're a victim. We've talked about this a bunch, right? Doggone it, I should have everything delivered to me on a silver platter. Why do I have to work? You know, Why do I have to show up? Why do I have to do things I don't like to do? Why can't I just take uh, the rest of my life as a gap year, a gap life, and travel Europe? Well, because that isn't how it works. And she, my mother, through all of this, this lesson's from a 95-year-old, Lesson one, and there were dozens, I just picked three or four here today, what she has shown is that she knows she's not special. She doesn't ask to be special. She has to be cared for because she's ill. And then she apologizes for being ill. Then she apologizes for being a burden. She's not a burden. She's my mother. The other thing that she's done, the other lesson, is I talk a lot about it as accountability. She's shown a tremendous amount of accountability and selflessness. See, my siblings, two of them, one that lives here in town and one that lives in, uh, in Texas, left um, a week and a half ago. She was out of the hospital, my mother, and she insisted they go on this trip. They went on a river uh, cruise over in Europe. 
Um, and then my sister that's here in town, uh, she and I were here to, to kind of hold the fort down. But my mother was insisting through selflessness, I want you to go on that trip and you don't come home even if I die. She, she said, <laughs> you will complete the trip even if I pass away while you're gone. She was so strong-minded and so bullheaded and so dedicated to that thought that they were going to go on this beautiful vacation they'd been planning that she had me change her death wishes, what happens at the end of death. See, she was going to be buried next to my father. They've paid for the, the vault and the dig in the hole and everything except the casket 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And she was so worried that she would pass away and there would be a body that they'd have to keep on ice, sorry to be morbid here, and my kids are then going to want to come home from this trip and I'm not going to do it. So she calls me up and she goes, I want you to figure out how to change it to cremation. Now, that's not a really enjoyable conversation. But the thing I now see in it two weeks later is she was accountable to her own desires that those other, my two siblings wouldn't have to come home early and she was being selfless, saying, bury the ashes, not the body. But this way it won't be on ice. They won't have to hurry back because you have to do something with the body in a certain amount of time. Um, uh, you know, there may not be room at the, uh, at the funeral home, etc. Made those calls. She wanted to be sure that they could change it. She just goes, I just want to be simple for everyone. She goes, and it could just be a family get together. See, she's, she's outlived two groups of friends. She had a lifelong friends. A bunch of them died in their 60s and 70s. She made other friends. They've all died in their 80s and early 90s, and here she is still ticking. She doesn't want the, the fanfare for herself. She wants everyone to be comfortable. She wants everyone to be at ease. She wants everyone to not feel burdened with the matriarch of our family when she passes. That's selfless. She's also been accountable. She doesn't want us um, you know, having the money go out of the pocket to take care of her. She she was actually talking to me. She's had long-term insurance for a long time. I've been paying into it. I owe another $800 this month for the six months. And she goes, it's just silly to be paying for it. Let's figure out how I can start to use some of those benefits for maybe a nurse coming up to my apartment twice a day, helping me with meals. She's not ready to go down into into assisted living yet. You now she's she's only 95. I mean, Brent, I can I can live on my own. But she wants to not have a, we've been supporting her a little bit, the four kids, because her and dad retired. She hasn't had a paycheck in 40 years. You got to save a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And then you've had this hyperinflation and the crap of the economy over the last three, four years, especially, and expenses are up. So we've been throwing a little bit at her here for a few years. It's all good. She wants to make sure that um, she has that nurse with the long term care. If she wants to order food from downstairs, see, they charge her $3 to bring it up to her apartment. And she goes, I'll just have the nurse go down and get it. That way I'm not wasting that $3 once a week. What? Everyone on this uh, episode that's listening right now dropped 8 bucks on their coffee this morning and probably on their second one. She's worried about $3 for the convenience of bringing food up to somebody that's 95 and just getting out of the hospital. I don't want to spend that money. That's not, that's not responsible. I'm not being accountable. I'm being accountable to you all. I want you to get all this money that you've helped me with. Not a lot. I want it to come back to you. And I can't be foolish with my money. Are you kidding me? When's the last time you've had something like that happen around in, a, in, in, in today's society? So when I say lessons of a 98, uh, 95-year-old, excuse me, it's episode 98, got, 99, excuse me, got confused. These are the types of things I'm talking about. She's living it. She's not saying it. She's not coaching it. She's playing it. And it's very, very valuable things for all of us to discuss. Let's go use that long-term health care that I've been doing. I get $75 a day. Maybe that pays for those nurses. I don't want to pay it out of pocket because I want to make sure that you guys have some money left over. I want to leave a little bit for you. See, she's always been accountable to that conservative lifestyle and money saving. Her and dad saved and saved and saved. Depression era kids. Today, people want to spend, spend, spend. You know, inflation isn't because people are living too well. Inflation is because government's living too well. We're spending money that we don't have. We're spending money as a country, like you got $8 in the bank account, and you go out and you want to buy a couple of Lamborghinis 
Just write a check, man. Just print some more money, man. See, she doesn't think that way. She's accountable to her own well-being, and she's being accountable to the loved ones that come, uh, come after her. Now, there's a lot of ways to be accountable, but she's being very fiscally responsible right now. The other couple things that I wanted to point out uh, here is, man, strength and optimism has been prevalent this entire time. She told me to leave this morning. I went in to see her, and this is a very contagious little uh, bacterial thing she's got going on, C. diff, if you want to look it up. It, it's not pretty. you got to stay clear. Spores live for 48 hours. I had to go down to her apartment and bleach all of her bedding and, and clean everything with, with Clorox wipes and spray Lysol everywhere and, and love doing it because it's my mother to make sure that it was okay when she got home. Now, she's been in the hospital long enough. All that would have died off. But she's sitting there in the hospital this morning. I'm standing eight feet away to talk to her. The nurses come in with little, put the little robe things on, the little gown things and gloves. Don't have to wear a mask, but just, you know, not to touch her. Well, she's kind of past that point. So she starts hustling me out going, listen, I need to use the restroom. Get out of here. You don't need to stand around here. Go home and rest. You got work this week, her exact words. I need you to rest so you can work hard this week. But she wanted me to get out so she could hit the nurse button on the little pad on her, on her bed there at the hospital, have them come in and get my walker and let's walk around the halls three or four times here. I got to get my strength back so I can go home so I can make bridge the bridge game this week. Yeah. Well, evidently she misses taking quarters from all the other people that live in her retirement community. But the point is, is that she wants to get her strength back. She's been strong and stoic through it. We face things in life all the time. You have to be able to be strong in a storm. She's showing optimism. I'm going to go take quarters from the ladies down in the bridge game. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to walk so I can be better. She's ready to go. She doesn't want to live to be 96, but that's God's choice, and she knows it. So she's going to be as strong as she can throughout all this. Some things are controllable. Some things aren't. Be very, very strong because you can face both with strength or both with weakness, and we all know strength is going to help you in all these endeavors. So she's now probably doing laughs with the nurses, laughing, talking about the big Hawkeye win yesterday, and she has shown optimism, which we talked about last week is going to help you much more in life than not being optimistic. The other thing she's done a tremendous job, and she has shown so much love and caring by insisting her kids or grandkids or great-grandkids, just work hard, don't worry about me. Give your best effort. She's been very reflective in this time. A lot of stories from the past, a lot of reminiscing, a lot of talking about dad, my hero, my dad, my hero, my mom. It's been great to reminisce. It's been sad at times, pulls on your heartstrings. But she focuses in on continue doing what you're doing, Brent. Continue being what we've shown you to be. Live life right. Don't live life easy. She's been talking about all the appreciation for all she has had and experienced in life. She's been very, very, um, like I said, reminiscent, but so thankful. So thankful for what we have. She has said multiple times, man, some people, I shouldn't complain. Some people are really, really sick. Some people have been fighting pain and discomfort for years. Some people are going through chemo. Some people, my wife's mother, didn't live to see 50, didn't live to see 47. My mom's 95 years old. Think of what, think of the strength she's had to show and others her age. Depression coming out of World War I, depression, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Cuban Missile Crisis, um, uh, assassinations of two Kennedys, Another presidential assassination attempt in Ford. Another presidential assassination attempt in Reagan. Another presidential assassination attempt in Trump. She's seen the Gulf Wars, both of them. She's seen Afghanistan. She's seen um, what's happened in Iraq. She's seen what's going on with the anti-Semitism coming out uh, from all over our own country because we forget to look at the past and remember history this anti-Semitism and this hatred and bigotry and is rampant in our country again, 
And it isn't coming from where they're saying it's coming from. Just think of all she's faced. And she still talks about everything she appreciates she got in life. Not, oh, poor me. I've had to live through all this. I'm a victim. Life's been hard. Life's been a blessing. So take that attitude in your life. Life is a blessing. We talked several weeks ago, change your mindset from, I have to go to work tomorrow to, I get to go to work tomorrow. I have to pay the mortgage bill. I get to pay the mortgage bill. I have a home. A lot of people can't even figure out and can't afford a home these days. Change your mindset. She has been wonderful in all this. She just wants us to be appreciative too. The friends, the laughs, all of that brought on by a couple of words, hard work. Her and dad, that whole generation, hard work. She finished today's commentary when I was in there with her, with a good one. I'd heard it before. Evidently, she had too. She brought up an old saying. She says, when you're, um, there's no one to blame. I wrote it down here. There was no one to blame for the rough road you were on in life, since typically it's your own asphalt. See, asphalt is like a road surface stuff or it's your own ass fault. How insightful is that? Don't blame others for the bumpy road in life you're on because it's your own ass fault. It's all about choices and decisions. It's about being conservative versus uh, not saving. It's uh, versus uh, spending unwisely. It's about working hard early in life to enjoy life later. Remember, life can be hard either now or later. Your choice. Choose your hard. This 95-year-old that has been laying in a bed, I'm fearful that uh, was going to die several times, in those last seven weeks has touched me um, in ways that I'll never forget, never take for granted. So what I'd ask all of you to do this week is to look, those, uh, look around you to those in your family that are older. If you don't have a great relationship with a parent or a sibling, fix that. If you haven't talked to your parents in a while, fix that. If you're having troubles at work, change your mindset or change your environment. Fix that. But most importantly, just work hard. Try hard. Lean into things. Be loving. Be caring. Be accountable. Show humility. All that turns into awesome. Keep that shit up. Talk next week.